Hello, my name is Aspan Osen. I work in the ER radiology department at NYU, and I'm going to discuss uh, OBGYN ultrasound or pelvic ultrasound after dark in the ER or emergent setting. So patients who need pelvic ultrasound, usually in the emergent setting, are coming in due to pain or bleeding. We then want to differentiate whether these patients are uh, pregnant or non-pregnant. So we'll look at both scenarios. The first scenario being the first trimester pregnancy coming in with pain and or bleeding. So the clinician is going to want to know what's the uh, prognosis for the baby for the pregnancy. Is it a viable pregnancy? Is it a non-viable pregnancy? Is it an ectopic pregnancy? Is it a pregnancy of unknown location, in which case it could still be any of the top three possibilities? Or is it a pregnancy of indeterminate viability, meaning that it is either viable versus non-viable? So, again, the golden rule in medicine, do no harm. And in this case, we don't want to call a viable pregnancy non-viable. So, what I'll be using are criteria from Dubelay, which is from 2013 New England Journal of Medicine, um, to determine non-viability in, preg in early pregnancy. So these are five numbers from that article. You basically have to put these to memory um, uh, in order to interpret first trimester uh, pelvic ultrasound. So uh, my memory tool I use is I went to 7-Eleven on 14th Street, played $25 in scratch-offs, and won $3,000. So that works for me, and you're welcome to use it or make up your own. Um, so we're going to go through eight cases. So uh, I kept those important numbers at the bottom of the screen. And again, we want to try and say, is it a viable, a non-viable, an ectopic, an unknown location or unknown viability pregnancy? So first case, here we have a sagittal view through the midline um, uterus. Here's a view through the adnexa. Another view of the adnexa. Uh, case number two, pregnant with pelvic pain and bleeding. So we have a sagittal view through the uterus, which is retroverted. A more cone down view near the cervix. Case number three. So here we have an intrauterine gestation. We see a yolk sac. We do have a fetal pole measuring 10 millimeters. No heart rate. Case number four, intrauterine gestation with a yolk sac. Case number five, we have a pregnancy with pain, mean sac diameter 37 millimeters. Case number six, a beta of 4,435. Pregnant. Case number seven, pregnant with a beta of 110,000. Sagittal view, waveform, another uh, sagittal view. And here's uh, case number eight, pregnant with pain. So this is midline through the sagittal, uh, sagittal view through the uterus. And this is uh, slightly oblique through the cornua. It's color. So let's go through the cases. Case number one, so we had this retroverted uterus. We don't see anything in the endometrial cavity, but if we go to the adnexa, we do see the ovary, but we see an additional structure, and the, the ovary being that structure which has follicles in it. This additional structure is right here. So in a pregnant patient, anything outside of the ovary is an ectopic until proven otherwise, and this turned out to be a, um, a tubal ectopic. Case number two, Retroverted uterus, so we have calipers on the endometrium. We do see the, uh, near the in the cervix there is a small cyst, but unlike a typical Nebothian cyst, it has a yolk sac. And in a pregnant patient, uh, this is typical of a cervical ectopic. Case number three, we have an intrauterine gestation with a yolk sac. We do have a fetal pole and measures 10 millimeter, however, no heart rate. So this takes us to our first of the important numbers at the bottom of the screen, number seven. So this turns out to be non-viable in that if you see a crown rump length of seven or more millimeters, however, no fetal heart rate, it's a non-viable pregnancy. Case number four, here we have an intrauterine gestation with a yolk sac, and this takes us to our second and third numbers at the bottom of the page. So 
This is a pregnancy of indeterminate viability. So we're going to follow this with a beta as well as repeat ultrasounds. If, however, after 11 days, this would be the second row here, if after 11 days on repeat ultrasound we still don't see a fetal pole with a heart rate, it's considered non-viable. If the initial ultrasound just showed a gestational sac, then we wait up to 14 days before we would call it non-viable on repeat ultrasounds. Case number five, we have a mean sac diameter of 37. So this takes us to the fourth number. Here, non-viability is an intrauterine gestational sac with mean sac diameter greater than 25 or greater without a fetal pole. And finally, uh, okay, this is in the next case, case number six, a beta of 4,435. So this takes us to our last number. So 3,000 is the cutoff. So here we didn't see an endometrial, uh, we don't see an intrauterine uh, gestation. So 3000 is that cutoff where we should see something, um, you know, we should see a, um, a pregnancy intrauterine. In this case, now that we don't see it, it's one of two possibilities. The more likely scenario is that it is a pregnancy which is non-viable, as that's more common. However, it is possible this could also represent an ectopic pregnancy of unknown location. So we're going to follow the betas. If they continue to go down, we know it's a non-viable, probably aborted pregnancy. If the betas, however, are going up, then we know we're dealing probably with an ectopic of unknown location, and the GYN can, uh, OBGYN can start treatment. Case number seven. So here we have the, uh, the uterus. We see the endometrium. It's very thick, very heterogeneous. Has very high velocity, low resistance flow. Here's some more, some more uh, dimensions. So very thickened. And this was in a 16 year old with a beta of 100. 10,000. So this turns out to be a molar pregnancy. So abnormal proliferation of trophoblastic cells, first, second trimester bleeding, rapid uterine enlargement, hyperemesis, usually the betas are over 100,000, rare malignant potential to choriocarcinoma, risk factors of prior molar pregnancy. The differential would be retained products, but usually that occurs after a DNC or after a, you know, a delivery. So the clinical picture would look a little different. Case number eight, so here we don't see any pregnancy within the endometrial cavity. If we go off to the cornua, we do see the gestational sac with a fetal pole. And look at that myometrium, it's super thin. So, you know, we, we did a color flow. So you see how hypervascular, if that pregnancy continues, it will most likely rupture the myometrium and that would be catastrophic. So this is typical of your interstitial or corneal ectopic. All right, so now the second scenario is the non-pregnant patient with pelvic pain or bleeding. And the most critical thing we look at are what are the surgical indications, and one of them being torsion, the other abscess or infection. We will sometimes see tumor. So let's look at cases again. Uh, the first three cases are one image from three different patients with right and exal pain. Here's the first. Here's the second patient, and here's the third patient. Here you have case number four, right at nexal pain. So here's the ovary. Notice the largest dimension is 4.4 centimeters. Here's this here's with color flow. And here's a Doppler waveform. This is the left side for comparison. And there's the Doppler waveform on the left side. Uh, the next one is pelvic pain. This is a transabdominal image, which I gave you. And he, just to orient you the, with the calipers is the sagittal view through the midline uterus. So I want you to look at the structures around the uterus. Case number six, pelvic pain with fevers. So here's the right adnexa. Here's vascular flow.
Case number seven, left lower quadrant pain with fever. So here we're going to go sequentially through the adnexa from top to bottom, much like a CT scanner. So here is the first image, second image, third image, and finally the fourth image. Next is a status post DNC with persistent bleeding for three days. Here's the first image, sagittally. Second image. Third image with color. And then the um, waveform. Next case is a DNC with abnormal bleeding for one month post procedure. First image. Second image. Third image in transverse. And then there's uh, the, the waveform. Next is IVF patient with abdominal pain and bloating. It's the first image of the right adnexa, left adnexa, waveform, and then just a more global view down in the pelvis. And then case number 11, bleeding. So let's go to case number one. So these are three different patients. So this first patient, uh, where I gave one image, the first patient with right adnexal pain. So this is typical of a hemorrhagic cyst. It has this lacy appearance, these angular fragments uh, and lines retract, consistent with a retracting clot. Through transmission may help differentiate this from solid um, masses, usually resolve in six to 12 weeks, can lead to ovarian torsion, however, if large enough. Second case, as opposed to the prior, was a cyst with a low level echo, so this is typical of our endometriomas. Functional endometrium outside of the uterus, a uniform low level internal echoes, persists on follow up imaging as opposed to the prior hemorrhagic cyst. 50% of bilateral can lead to ovarian torsion. Third case is this lesion. So this is typical of the dermoid. So it's a mature teratoma with well-differentiated cells from three derm germ layers. This is typical of the dermoid plug with an echogenic nodule with an assist with dirty shadowing. They can have calcification. They can also lead to ovarian torsion if large enough. If they rupture, they can lead to chemical peritonitis. Average age is 30, but they stop growing after menopause. Malignant transformation can occur in older patients. They tend to be quite large. Case number four, so this was right at nexal pain. So here we have the right ovary, largest dimension, 4.4 centimeters. We see these small cysts, which are peripheral in location. There's not really that much color flow. The waveform, we do get an arterial waveform. It's very peripheral though. Comparing it to the left side, this has a more typical appearance of an ovary. The cysts are more, you know, throughout. Uh, the flow is a little more, is more exuberant. So in this case, patient with right adnexal pain, we suspected ovarian torsion, which it turned out to be. So enlarged ovary, usually greater than four centimeter in a longer in a single dimension, I start to suspect it may be enlarged. Small peripheral cysts, which are being pushed out due to the edema within the ovary, looking for any lead point mass. And this just proves the point that an arterial waveform does not necessarily exclude torsion. And usually the patient will be exquisitely tender on the side of the torsed ovary. So I'll always ask the tech if they were tender on the suspected side. Case number five, non-pregnant with sudden onset of pain. So this was at transabdominal view. So here again, antiverted uterus with calipers on it, midline. And I wanted you to differentiate and see this structure right here and look at the abnormal location anteriorly. So this is a hemorrhagic cyst resulting in a torsed ovary, uh, basically a mass leading a, a mass serving as a lead point, abnormal location above the uterus, severe pain, and I mean, we didn't see any flow in this case, but again, just a reminder, arterial waveform in an ovary does not exclude the diagnosis of torsion. Uh, next case, this is just a corollary 29-year-old with pelvic pain. So we did a CT initially, and we had this low attenuation structure posteriorly, midline. It's a little suspicious. On ultrasound, it has a typical homogeneous appearance. It's enlarged, not great flow, and it's turned out to be a torsed ovary, and this is just the CT appearance. 
Another corollary, pelvic pain for one month, slowly improving, but suddenly worse. So here we have a similar appearing, low attenuation structure, midline, posteriorly. posteriorly. Again, suspicious for possibly a torsed ovary, but a little strange looking. It's got this rim of hypervascularity, so or slightly like a rim, like a little rim of wall. So could this be like a um, chronically torsed ovary? This is what it looked like on ultrasound. Again, not your typical torsed ovary. Uh, the tech was, though, astute enough to see what she thought could be a separate left ovary. But since we couldn't 100% be sure, we, sus we just put it as a concern for a torsed ovary, uh, given that this is the overall appearance. And it actually turned out to be an endometrioma. So that's just an interesting case in that um, you can have similar appearance uh, on CT, but um, in this case, uh, you know, based on the clinical, as well as uh, slightly strange, you know, abnormal ultrasound findings, it turned out to be a different diagnosis. So there is overlap. Uh, pelvic pain with fevers. So this is the right adnexa, multiple fluid fluid levels. It's a large mass, hypervascular. And this is it on CT. You see an IUD in place. So here's that structure. So this turned out to be a tubo ovarian abscess. Again, the IUD in place predisposes to PID. Um, complex solid cystic mass, fluid debris levels, as we had seen in this case, fever, pain, and discharge. Rupture with peritonitis um, can happen, so important to treat these um, uh, pretty rapidly. The next, the next case, left lower quadrant pain with fever. So here we have the ovary, and then we have the structure next to the ovary. As we go down through the adnexa, this tubular structure starts to elongate. And here it is. So notice the thickened wall, the debris within this tube, and the peripheral echogenicity suggesting inflammation. So this turned out to be a pyosalpinx, inflamed and obstructed fallopian tube. And this is just a corollary study. This was a uh, patient who had pelvic pain. Here's what the left had next. It looked like this large mass, very complex looking. Here was the right side, again, large mass, complex looking. This is what it looked like on CT. So now we're thinking, okay, could these be two bovarian abscesses? Wasn't really so septic though. Could, these, could this be malignancy? So this patient ended up getting an MRI and you see multiple fluid hematocrit levels. So this turned out to be endometriosis. And here on sagittal imaging, we see this tethering along the ligament. So this is consistent with deep pelvic endometriosis. <laughs> Next case is status post DNC, persistent bleeding for three days. Uh, I'm sorry, three days later. So here's a sagittal view. Here's a thickened endometrium. It's got some color flow in it. It's got high velocities. So this is consistent with the retained products of conception. Incomplete uterine evacuation or the retained placental tissue. Presents a few days after delivery or, or abortion. Persistent thickening of the endometrium. Vascular flow within the endometrium. You want to differentiate this from just normal endometrial clot, which usually has no flow. And, you know, there is a caveat. Occasionally, retained products can have no flow, but it's but um, relatively rare. Uh, molar pregnancy. You want to differentiate that, but that uh, from that uh, diagnosis. But usually, molar pregnancies have a sky-high quant, and they have a very different clinical picture as they had not recently delivered or had an abortion. Um... The next is also you want to differentiate it from an AVM, which tends to be myometrial in location, which we'll see momentarily. So this was the other case, the DNC with abnormal bleeding for one month post-procedure. So we see this hypoechoic structure within, with, not within the endometrium, but within the adjacent myometrium. It's very hypervascular. Here's sagittal imaging. You see multiple vessels, a tangle of vessels. So this turned out to be, here. Uh, here's the waveform high velocity, low resistance. So this turned out to be a uterine AV fistula or malformation. 
presumably secondary to procedure. Uh, again, we saw a small hypoechoic region, which was the tangle of vessels, mosaic color signal appearance with aliasing, low resistance flow with high peaks of uh, velocities. Um, and this must be diagnosed as if, this must be diagnosed in the sense that if you were to do a D and C on this patient, you know, mistaking this for retained products, this would be catastrophic as it could lead to life threatening hemorrhage. Um, here is just the. Um, Angio, they ended up embolizing this patient, and that preserves fertility, though hysterectomy is the definitive treatment. Um, this was another case, just a, a corollary ble uh, bleeding for one month after IUD placement. Here's the IUD. It's kind of low in position, not great. Color, you see all this hypervascular flow extending into the myometrium. So this was another case of uh, an AV fistula or malformation secondary to procedure. And this just shows the high velocity, um, low resistance flow. Case number 10, status post-IVF with abdominal pain and bloating. So here is the right adnexa. Here's the left adnexa, again enlarged. These are typical appearances uh, after IVF treatment with large ovaries with multiple cysts. They do have flow in them. When here's that global view, you see all this uh, ascites with low-level echoes, possibly hemorrhage. So this is typical of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome and then it's associated with IVF and they generally have this um, um, these typical symptoms of abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, weight gain, oliguria. They may have shortness of breath. Uh, they tend to develop ascites with debris, pleural effusions, usually self-limiting with supportive care, occasionally to help alleviate some of the symptoms, they may get paracentesis or thoracentesis. Case number 11, heavy bleeding. So we have the structure in the middle of the uterus. Looks typical of a um, fibroid. And then we see the splayed vessels. So this turns out to be an intracavitary fibroid, pedunculated lesion extending into the endometrial cavity. Can affect fertility due to structural distortion often expelled after embolization. They tend to be larger than endometrial polyps, which are more homogeneous and echogenic. Uh, and as opposed to the splayed vessels we see in a fibroid, the um, polyps tend to have a single central vessel. So in summary, patients coming into the ER emergent setting, they usually come in for pain or bleeding. We want to differentiate between those that are pregnant and non-pregnant. In the pregnant patient, we're going to look, uh, in our case, at first trimester, the diagnostic criteria for viability. Seven or greater, if you have a crown rump length without a heart rate, it's non-viable. If the initial ultrasound showed a gestational sac with a yolk sac, if after repeat ultrasound imaging, 11 days later, there is still no fetal pole with heart rate, it's considered non-viable. If the initial imaging showed just a gestational sac, you wait up to 14 days before you call it non-viable. Um, if you see a intrauterine gestational sac with a mean sac diameter of 25 or greater without a, viable, a fetal pole, non-viable. Uh, and if you have a beta over 3,000, you normally should see an intrauterine gestation. If you do not, it's most likely an aborted pregnancy. However, it could also be an ectopic of unknown location. So then you must continue following the betas. And if they are not trending... Um, trending down, then you are concerned for the ectopic and um, they may start treatment. Um, we saw different types of ectopics, the tubal, which is the most common. We saw cervical and corneal ectopics. Uh, this was the article from which a lot of these criteria, from which these criteria were obtained, which is an excellent read. In the non-pregnant patient, retained products of conception, differentiating that from clot, which tends to be non-vascular, molar pregnancies, which tend to have a different clinical picture, uh, they're usually not after a delivery or they're not diagnosed after a delivery or a DNC. And then AVMs, which tend to be more myometrial. Um, torsion is a, a something we don't want to miss. That's a, a surgical emergency. Again, an arterial waveform does not exclude torsion. You're going to look for a lead point mass, abnormal location, severe localized tenderness, uh, on exam, I tend to use uh, a dimension of greater than four centimeter. 
uh, to start thinking that maybe this ovary is enlarged. And that's it. And I want to thank you and stay safe.